dando prosseguimento à terceira semana de matemática aplicada, de engenharia matemática e matemática aplicada da FRJ, agora à tarde vamos ter a palestra da professora Tamara Broderick, do MIT. A professora pediu e encorajou a quem quiser para ligar a câmera durante sua apresentação. Now in English. A palestra será em inglês. Now in English. Uh, it is my great pleasure to, to introduce today Professor Tamara Broderick. Tamara is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical Engineer and Computer Science at MIT. She is also a member of the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, CSA, the MIT Data, Statistics and Data Science Center, and the Institute for Data, Systems and Society. She completed her PhD in statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. Some of her fields of interest are Bayesian inference and graphical models, with an emphasis on scalable, and parametric, and unsupervised learning. Today, she'll be giving us a talk about NOMON, an open source software designed to allow single switch communication, drawing, gaming, and other graphical user usage for individuals with severe moral impairments. Professor. Great. Um, thanks for having me out today. It's really great to um, be here and talking to you all. Uh, so as you just said, um, today I'm going to be talking about our software Nomen. It uses Bayesian machine learning uh, to enable people with severe motor impairments to easily use graphical user interfaces, for instance, to write, um, to draw, to browse the web. Um, and before I get into the details of Nomen, um, I just want to highlight um, the fantastic team that I get to work with here. Uh, so Nick Boniker is an amazing undergraduate student at MIT, and our wonderful collaborators are Dr. Emily Marie Nell in South Africa and Professor Keith Bertanen in Michigan. Okay, so in, let's see if I can, here we go. Um, so in that title slide, I mentioned using a single switch. So let's just spend a moment saying, you know, what it is uh, to use a single switch. So in particular, I'm thinking here about individuals with really severe motor impairment. Um, so beyond what we typically think for paraplegia or even quadriplegia, we're thinking of individuals with basically near total paralysis, like they might have locked-in syndrome um, or cerebral palsy or something like that. Um, so there are some individuals that you may have even heard of already um, who uh, were in this situation. Um, I think very famously, uh, Stephen Hawking, an extremely famous cosmologist. Um, in 1963, he was diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, he lost his speech after a bout of pneumonia in 1985. And after that, he would use his hand um, to press a, a button, a switch. Um, and then eventually he moved to using a single cheek muscle. Um, to activate his switch. Uh, another example of this uh, is um, somebody, Jean-Dominique Bobby, who is the French editor of the magazine Elle. Uh, he suffered a stroke in 1995 at the age of 43, and then he had locked-in syndrome. Um, and so he would blink one of his eyes to communicate. And, and just via blinking, he wrote and edited um, a book, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, and that was actually turned into a motion picture, which um, you know maybe you're already familiar with, but if you aren't, you might check out. Um, also, Don Fazy Webster had a stroke um, in 2003 at the age of 30, and then she had locked-in syndrome. Um, and amazingly, since then, she's completed her bachelor's in ancient history. Um, again, just via blinking, she wrote her autobiography. She did a TEDx talk. I mean, these are really, really um, amazing individuals, and we want to ask ourselves. You know, how can we make their lives easier? How can we make it um, straightforward for them to communicate? So in all of these cases, individuals are communicating with what we might call a single switch. So they're, they're activating some kind of switch. It could be just blinking. Um, it could be that they're pressing a button. It could be that they're literally just puffing air at particular times. There's this thing called a sit puff switch, but basically they control times of activation um, of some particular switch, and that's the data that we're gonna get from them and that we can use for you know, any way that they might communicate or interact with technology. And so the thing I'm gonna talk about today is our open source software, Nomen, um, that is designed to facilitate writing, drawing, gaming, and other general graphical user interface usage um, with such a single switch. So basically, where I'm going from here 
is that we're going to talk about NAMIT and how it works. I'm going to start by saying, what are the existing methods that people are using for this? Um, you know, obviously everybody I just talked about um, has done amazing things in their lives. What were they using for single switch communication? And along the way, we'll talk about what are the goals for single switch communication? What are we, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, in single switch communication. And then we'll talk about how NAMIN can help us with some of those goals and getting closer to, you know, perhaps um, the types of things that we would like to do. What are the benefits of this software? Um, at that point, um, hopefully you'll be motivated to care about why did does NAMIN work? How, what's going on under the hood? Um, you know, what's the sort of inner workings there? I'll talk a little bit about um, how NAMIN works in practice in terms of user studies and I'll just highlight that this is ongoing work. This is stuff that we're working on literally right now. Um, and I think there's just a lot of work for um, a lot of cool things to be done in this area. And so I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Okay, so let's start with thinking about um, what are the methods uh, that people are already using for single switch communication? And what are the pluses and, pluses and minuses um, of those methods? So if you um, went back to that earlier slide with some pictures of individuals. Um, Jean-Dominique Bobby, noticeably in his picture, was with an assistant. Um, and the way that this guy, when he was, was writing his book, would, would communicate is that this assistant would read out the letters of the alphabet in some order, and he would blink when she got to the one that he wanted um, to talk about. So the, I think the real assistant was in the other picture. Um, this is a still from the motion picture, the movie. Um, and so this is an actress who is playing that role. Um, also, you'll notice that um, these aren't letters in alphabetical order for efficiency. Um, they were put into frequency order. So we start with the most frequent letter, in this case um, for the French language, because he was speaking in French. Um, and then it ends with the least frequent letter, I guess, in the French language being W. Um, and so on one hand, you know, it's great that he was able to write this book this way, but I really want to highlight some real deficiencies of this method. Um, and I think just by far the worst part is that it is not automated. Um, if you are in this situation, you want to be able to do things when there isn't somebody around. You know, you maybe want to look at the web, you want to write something. Um, and more to the point in terms of your safety, you want to be able to alert somebody. Um, you know, if you're in a wheelchair and you're up against a radiator and you're burning or something is happening that you need to alert somebody in an emergency, you want to not have to wait until somebody can prompt you because they're around. You want to be able to, you know, make that alert anytime. Um, and so, you know, this also uses up a lot of somebody else's time. Um, they could be doing other things, even other caretaking things. And so there's just for so many reasons, uh, we just absolutely want to automate this kind of thing. Um, now, in addition to that, uh, there are other issues here. Um, one is just efficiency. Um, we don't expect necessarily that somebody who has locked in syndrome, who um, you know, is, is motor impaired in this way is going to be able to you know, type at the same rate that an able-bodied individual would type, but we'd like to be as efficient as possible. And you can see that this would be pretty inefficient. You know, if you're trying to use the letters that are at the end of this, you have to go through every other letter to get there. And that's just gonna take a long time and it's probably gonna be pretty frustrating. It's also worth noting that basically you only have letters here. You could add maybe other letters or numbers, but everything you add, you have to go through and everything has to be in a sequence. And so if you wanna do things beyond text, if you want to draw, if you want to play games, if you wanna you know, browse the web, um, you, can't, you can't do that, certainly with somebody just reading it to you here. And so we really just wanna get beyond um, that kind of framework and get to something that's gonna be a lot better. Now, um, before we go to, I think, what is, what is basically the modern sort of most common um, method that people might be using, I'll mention, you might be thinking of something like Morse code. And so there are two, at least two major problems that I want to bring up with Morse code. So one, and maybe this is even a little bit lesser, is that it actually requires more than we're assuming that these individuals can do right now. So we're assuming that they can control activation of a switch, but not duration necessarily. And in Morse code, you need both activation and duration. But I think even more to the point, we require or we want going forward to get beyond, again, just text, to get beyond just, you know, choosing from this very specific alphabet. And so Morse code can definitely only handle text. You know, we're not going to be drawing or, you know, browsing the web or playing a game. 
with that. And so we really want to find something that'll let us have um, you know, more capability in that direction. Okay, so what do people actually use? Well, this is Dawn Fazy Webster from before, um, and you can see that she has this sort of grid of options um, that she's able to choose on her computer. Um, and indeed, uh, sort of the common thing that people would use nowadays is so-called row column scanning. So let me just illustrate that um, in a little cartoon here on the side. So suppose that I was just choosing among the letters of the alphabet, the way row column scanning would work is it would highlight a row and then it would highlight a row and then it would highlight a row and I will activate my switch. I'll click, let's say, and so it could be um, hitting a button, it could be the puff of air, whatever, when it gets to the row that I want. And so suppose that I, you know, puff air when it gets to this row. Um, so now it's going to highlight within that row the first column and then it's going to highlight the second column and then it's gonna highlight the third column. And now suppose I wanted to choose the letter M, I will activate my switch again, I'll click, um, and now I'll have chosen the letter M. And so that's row column scan. And so the first big thing um, that we just immediately see that this is you know, such a big step up over what we were doing before is that this is automated. This is something that you can just have on a computer in front of you and you don't have to rely on somebody else being there. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, but you know, we want more than that, as we said before. Another big thing here is that this is more time efficient. So if you're thinking about choosing those letters, um, you know, sort of in the corner, you don't have to go through every other letter to get there. Um, there are fewer letters that you have to step through. So that's really helpful. Um, and another super helpful thing here is that we're not limited just to particular letters. And so you could actually put into some of these blocks an actual word completion. Um, and we know from our own cell phones and um, email increasingly nowadays, that that can just really speed up communication, and certainly that's going to be the case here. Now, that being said, there are still limitations. Um, in terms of efficiency, it's still really difficult to choose the lower right-hand corner. You still have to go through, you know, all the rows and all the columns to get there, and that's just going to be a pain, and you're not going to want to do that. Um, something that's also worth keeping in mind is that we also want to minimize the number of clicks. Um, that can be, you know, uh, something that could be taxing, especially for a motor impaired individual. Um, I don't think it's too bad here, but it is technically more clicks for character, for instance, um, than we had in the previous case. Although with uh, word completions, that might go down again. Um, okay, so what about, um, what else do we get here? Um, we can not only include word completions, but we can also include menu options. And so you really see this uh, in, in the picture um, of Don. Um, over here, you can see that, you know, maybe she could start typing, but she could also perhaps, you know, actually move her chair or do some other kinds of actions. And so that's a little bit more freeing um, than just being able to type a very limited set of characters. But there's still a lot of limitations. Um, what you're doing has to be in a grid. Um, so that doesn't really open up um, drawing. Maybe you could fill a you know, an entire screen with a grid, but then the problem is it just takes forever, like much longer, the more things you add to the grid. And so that's not really feasible. Um, if you wanna do some kind of gaming, it would have to be arranged in a grid and lots of games are not. If you wanna do something on the web, again, it would have to be arranged in a grid and, you know, typically the web is not. And so um, this is again, somewhat limiting. Also something that's worth noticing here is that um, you do have to change focus pretty quickly to use this. Um, you have to like be following these rows and then these columns as they move. Um, and you have to do that pretty, pretty continuously. And if you do turn down the rate at which that's happening, then you're gonna type so much more slowly. And so that can be pretty taxing to keep up with that, to always be changing your focus, especially again, um, if you're in this uh, population potentially. Um, and so, so we'd like to be able to address these concerns and certainly our attempt to do so um, is with this, this alternative software on Nomen. So let me just describe in a little detail um, about how this works and then uh, we'll see a demo, we'll see a demo a few times. And I'll also just note that it is freely available online so anybody can try it out at any time. So suppose there are three things that I am interested in choosing between. I just wanna choose either the letter M or the letter I or the letter T. And so what's gonna be happening here is next to each thing that I'm interested in choosing, there's gonna be a clock with a fixed hand at noon in red. It's just fixed, it's never gonna move. 
And then there's a moving hand, an hour hand that's going around and around, and it's always at the same rate um, that it's moving. And so you as the user are asked to click to activate your switch when the hour hand for the clock you're interested in hits noon. So for instance, if I was interested in choosing I, and I happen to see the clocks like this, I would probably click right now. If I were interested in choosing the M, I would wait a little bit longer until that um, clock moved over to the M. And then you may need to click a few more times until the program is sufficiently sure that that is the letter that you wanted. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, check out a demo of this, and then we'll we'll come back to these slides. So, just okay. So this is all online. Um, I'll show you the website URL a few times later in the presentation, and certainly at the end. Uh, but it's something that you could just go to right now if you wanted to. Um, now, rather than look at this whole thing, let's just look in the corner for the moment. And let's suppose that I'm interested in either typing U, V, Z, or this apostrophe. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at Z. I'm going to plan to type Z. And I'm going to wait until the, um, that hour hand, again, is right on top of noon. And then I'm going to click my switch, which in this case is the space bar. And then I'll do it again. Um, and I'll do this until I get this big green, you know, indicator that I have actually typed successfully what I was interested in typing. And so now let's suppose I want the U. Um, you know, this is a little bit choppy, I think, when you're seeing it in video. But, um, you know, again, I encourage you to, to actually just check it out directly. Um, but I just click when that moving hand is on top of the hour hand. And also I see, not in addition to the big green sort of um, uh, indicator, that I've typed Z and U at the bottom here. And something we're going to see later is that as I type, it will suggest different word completions. And that's what we're seeing over here. Um, so before I go on, um, maybe I'll just check if anybody has any questions. Um, maybe, uh, maybe not. But um, but let me know if so. OK. Okay, so I'll go back over here to the slideshow and we'll come back to that demo again we later. Oh, we have a question now. Yeah. Um, in the row column example, it is used a better vessel of a linear search. Why not a binary search? Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting idea. So a binary search is definitely more mathematically efficient. Um, there's certainly a trade off in usability here. Um, so you have to think about how you can do that in a way that. Um, is, is going to be familiar, is going to be something that people can easily use. But I think that absolutely that is something that, you know, one could explore, maybe just highlight one versus the other and then slowly um, uh, sort of, you know, nail down. Um, I think it would be cool to try out. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head if somebody already has, but, um, but I think you could try it out either way and see how it works. Um, I will say, though, that even with binary search, you're still going to have some of these issues that I described, like things have to be in a grid or something that you can put into binary search. Um, and what we'd like to do is free ourselves from that um, and, and be able to be more flexible. And I'll, I'll show some examples of that in just a second when I get back to this slideshow. Yeah, I think it's really interesting um, to think in this direction about like, what could we do even better? And I'm, I'm just convinced that there are things like that Naman isn't the end of you know, this story, that there are things that you could do that are even much better. And so I think that's a great direction to be thinking. Um, okay, so this is uh, the website for the demo that I just showed you. I'll come back to it later. And again, I'll show it at the end of the slides too. So don't worry if you're not picking it up just this moment. Um, okay, so let's start thinking. I think we're already starting to think about, you know, why is uh, Naman useful? Why is this something that we would want to look at? Um, and an immediate thing that comes up is exactly what we were all just talking about, this flexibility. I can put these clocks anywhere on the screen. It doesn't have to just be that I'm choosing among, a, you know, this, this very small set of options that are all, you know, arranged in a grid or all just, um, you know, uh, characters, like it can really be much more flexible. And I just want to show you a couple of examples of that um, before we go on. So one is this very early prototype um, that I made uh, a while back, which is um, Nomen for drawing. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, this could be made much more uh, clean and, and nice, like the, the sort of online interface that I was just showing you. Um, but this really shows that you can literally fill the screen with clocks in Nomen. And what's nice is that, um, 
the the choosing the clocks is so efficient, even with just a ton of clocks, that this is still really realistic. And so actually, um, just before the, this awesome undergrad that I'm working with, Nick, started working with me, uh, he went ahead and used this program and drew the MIT logo. And this is what he sent me by email. Um, and so that's what I'm, I'm showing you now. This is actually um, being used. And I think that's, that's a pretty cute um, use of it. So basically, you can just draw lines, you can draw rectangles, you can do whatever, and it's, it's, it's pretty efficient. Um, this is more of a, a sort of sketch or a mock-up. This isn't actually something that we've made, although I think it would be really cool to do so. Um, so here we're looking at what this might look like for web browsing. Uh, so this is a particular website. It's for this podcast, 99% Invisible. It's a pretty cool podcast. Um, and you can see that basically, you know, if I were browsing the web, there's sort of a limited set of things that I typically would click on. Um, in this case, you know, if we have the upper right hand corner, uh, I can get to a menu. Um, if I go to the upper left hand corner, I go back to the home page. Uh, there's a play button towards the bottom. I can read more about this particular episode. There's a series of three buttons to add this episode to my queue, to download this episode, or to get a transcript of this episode. And what I could do with Nomin is I could just put a clock next to each thing that I might be interested in selecting. And so that's, you know, um, not too much extra. I'm using this website in the way that it typically is used, just with a little extra functionality. Okay, so let's let's go through this a little bit more systematically. Why might Nomin be useful? Um, what are what could we get out of this? Um, well, one, it's automated. Again, like that's that should be our first and foremost concern. Um, but I think what's really different from these previous methods is exactly this flexibility that we can put these clocks anywhere on the screen, um, and it seems that we can really get a lot more that you can do in the way that like a, a, an able-bodied user would take for granted. Um, that you can do this drawing, you can play games, you can browse the web, you can you know, use a file system or choose among pictures, et cetera. Um, it's relaxed in the sense that we described before, that you know, often you don't wanna have to be changing your focus all the time. And here you can focus on just the clock you're interested in and just select for that clock and then take a break and come back and make another selection later. Um, and one thing that's nice about this too is that when you go and take a break, nothing's really changed with the clocks. Whereas with the row column scanning, you know, you, you take a break and then, oops, you missed that one little window where you could actually select your thing. And now you have to go through all of the rows or all of the columns again. Um, we haven't seen this yet, but I'll show more later um, that this is efficient in selecting words per minute um, and also clicks per selection. Also something we haven't seen yet, but I'll talk about as we go, is that it's adaptive um, in the sense that, you know, there are a lot of different types of users. You might be an extremely precise clicker and, you know, almost always get right on top of noon, whereas you can imagine a motor impaired user um, might actually be pretty noisy in the way that they click. And we want to be able to accommodate all of those users and not just have them make a ton of errors and get very frustrated. Um, and so we, we do that here. Now, something that you might also be thinking about, and I think is very complementary to Nomin, is what's known as brain-computer interfaces. So there's this, this great promise that we can have the ability to sort of hook up to our brain signals um, and just control either you know, some kind of synthetic limb or a computer directly that way. And I think there's a lot of really cool work here. But a lot of it's invasive. Um, you actually have to you know, change something about your body to get it to work. Um, increasingly, there's some work on trying to make things not invasive, but I, at least to the best of my knowledge, that still requires a lot of really specialized equipment. Um, and so relatively speaking here, well, you're definitely not going to have anything invasive. Um, two, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, you know, so everybody who is listening to this right now has the ability to see a visual and to click on some kind of switch. And so it's certainly available in that sense. Um, you do need to have a computer or a phone or something like that, but, um, but certainly less onerous than having all this special equipment and it's usable right now. So literally you can just go to the website um, and use it. Again, you don't have to go into a special medical appointment. Okay. So, so that gives us a sense of, you know, why Nomin might be useful. Let me just briefly, before I go to, into like the super details of, of, you know, what is operating under the hood in Nomin to say, why is it called Nomin? Um, I named it after this indicator on a sundial. Um, so if you, if you look up G-N-O-M-O-N, this is the name for the thing that makes a shadow on a sundial. And we have these sort of distinctive clocks. Um, and so this is just that word, but without the G. Okay. So let's spend a little time saying, you know, what's really going on in Nomin? How does it actually work under the hood? And a way that's useful to think about this is that fundamentally, um, 
we're looking at a data analysis problem. Um, that is to say we have data and by analyzing it, we can turn it into a useful signal. And so let's think about like, what would be the way to frame that um, to make that work? So you can think of the data as the times that a user activates their switch. Those are the clicks. Um, again, a puff of air or a blink or what have you. So we could call those times T1 up to Tn. We could abbreviate that as T1 colon N or T. Uh, but essentially we have this sequence of times. And now a typical problem in machine learning or statistics is that you wanna learn about something that you didn't already know. And here exactly the thing that we're interested in learning is which clock the user wanted to select. Um, now, one way to think about this is that we have a sequence of times and a sequence of clocks. Another way to think about it is we break down into individual data analysis chunks. So for each clock that you wanna select, you have a sequence of click times and you wanna learn that clock and then you're gonna get a new data analysis problem and a new data analysis problem. And we just wanna keep doing that. And so the goal is just, you know, it's very similar to anything else we would do in machine learning or statistics. We want to take observed data and turn it into inference about some unobserved quantity. Here it's the desired clock. Now, because people click um, you know, with some noise, they're not perfect at clicking at a particular time, what we're really gonna be doing is some kind of probabilistic inference, like which clock is the most likely that they were trying to choose. Um, and so as soon as we say this, as soon as we say, hey, we're doing some kind of probabilistic inference, a really natural framework for that is Bayesian analysis. So we're gonna formulate this as a Bayesian inference problem. So a Bayesian inference problem starts with a set of observed data. In our case, we just said that's the times, the click times. We have some unknown parameter that we're interested in learning about. In our case, that's the clock, and the clock that's associated with those click times, and we're trying to learn it. And then after we have the data, there are two main ingredients in a Bayesian data analysis problem. There's the likelihood, which relates our observed data to the unknown clock. It says, if we knew the clock, what would the observed data look like? Fundamentally, that's gonna express something like, well, if we knew the clock, we think the, the clicks would be somewhere near noon. And I'll go into that in a second in, a, in, in an upcoming slide. Um, the prior tells us, what do we know about the clocks before we get started? Um, in the case of text entry, we actually know quite a bit. Um, but for the moment, let's just assume we don't know anything um, and we have a uniform distribution over the clocks um, that you know, we think M and I and T are equally likely and we're just choosing between these three clocks. Now, um, Bayes' rule will let us turn this knowledge before we get any data together with our data into what do we know after we've seen the data, the so-called posterior. And I have to say, Bayesian inference is extremely important and Bayes' rule alone is extremely important. I mean, if you wanted to turn um, sensitivity and specificity numbers about a COVID-19 test into actually knowing the accuracy of that test, you would have to use Bayes' rule. If you were interested in looking at DNA analysis in some crime scene investigation, you would know the probability of you know, some type of analysis given that somebody was guilty and you'd wanna turn that into the probability that they're guilty given the analysis. So this is just something that is so important in so many areas of life, but here we're gonna be using it to figure out which clock people are trying to click. And so what that's gonna look like is we're gonna start before we've seen any data, um, before we've seen any data, our, our knowledge about this clock is basically the prior. We just know whatever we had going in. And then we observe the first click, somebody clicks, and maybe it, they happen to click nearer the noon on M than the noon on I and T. And so we think that M is a little bit more likely. And now suppose they click again, and again, they happen to click nearer the noon on M than the noon time on I or T. And so M is looking a little bit more likely and maybe they click again and this keeps happening. And so we have to ask ourselves at what point does this program say, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's M and select M. Um, and so that's exactly the algorithm that we're gonna have. We're gonna do this computation. We're gonna calculate the Bayesian posterior. And then we're gonna select a clock when its probability is greater than some threshold. So the total probability here is 100%. Um, and so perhaps that threshold could be 95%. But what's interesting here is you can actually make this user specified. Like suppose that you're doing something really important, like you're taking your final exam or you're entering a government form and you don't wanna mess it up, then you could have this be a really high threshold. Whereas if you're doing something like, you know, browsing cat pictures on the internet, you don't really care that it's absolutely accurate. Um, and so you could turn this down and just go through more quickly. Okay, so that's, that's the basic idea. That's how this is gonna operate. And we're just gonna spend a little time now talking about what exactly does the prior look like and what exactly does the likelihood look like. 
Okay, so let's start with the prior. So the prior is what do we know about the clocks before we've seen any clicks for this clock? Now that's gonna be super application dependent, but let's start with writing because that's a case where we really do know quite a lot. Okay, so let's talk about writing. So in writing, suppose that you saw the following text. You know, somebody had already written, did you read the N-E-W-S P-A-P-E? and they're about to write another letter. And so we're trying to figure out what clock they're gonna select. Now, even before they've done any clicks for this clock, I bet that you have a pretty good idea what letter they're gonna choose. Um, it's, it's probably R. Um, so it's, they're probably writing out the word newspaper. Now, that's not absolutely certain. They could have created some, you know, maybe new company that has an unusual name. Um, and so there could be some other letter that goes in here. And so we want to make sure that that's possible. We don't want to put zero probability on anything, so it's impossible to select. But we want it to be easier to select the most likely thing so that overall, they're more efficient. Overall, they're able to make um, you know, uh, quicker writing and select things with fewer clicks. OK, so we want to think about how to express this. So in order to do that, let's introduce just a little notation. Let's say that for this particular word, the first letter is L1, the second letter is L2, and so on until we get to the eighth letter, L8. And then there's this letter that we're thinking about filling in, L9. Um, and we could say that nine is maybe the, the nth uh, letter in this word. So in general, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, what's, what is um, the, you know, the distribution over letters for this letter we're trying to fill in? We could do that based on all of the letters we've seen so far. Here, I'm just doing it based on the letters in the same word. So the probability of the clock in this prior then is gonna be the probability of this letter we haven't seen yet given all of the previous letters in the word. So the nth letter given all of the previous n minus one letters. Uh, it's just a fact of probability that this is gonna be the probability of all of the letters, including that last letter divided by the string before the last letter. And the issue is that we don't know this probability. Um, so we're gonna to have to estimate it somehow. Um, and this is a really common situation in natural language processing. And so there are a lot of really great tools to do it. So we really just borrow um, one of those existing tools. Essentially, one idea that you might have is to say, let's just count how often all of these strings occur in the world. You know, maybe I'll look at all of this data from Wikipedia, and that'll just be a, a set of strings um, in whatever language I'm looking at. And here it happens to be English. And I could count how many times the word newspaper occurs and how many times the string N-E-W-S-P-A-P-E occurs. Now, the problem with that method is that there are lots of things I might want to type that didn't just happen to occur in this corpus. Like maybe, maybe I want to type my last name, Broderick, um, but maybe in this particular corpus, it just doesn't occur. And so I don't want to say that's impossible. I want it to be possible. And so what I might do is what's known as smoothing. I might say, I'm going to take some of the probability mass from those existing words that I've counted and move them to words that I haven't seen yet, but are totally possible. And so that's a really common thing to do, what's known as n-gram smoothing. Um, here we use a particularly um, popular uh, language model known as KenLM, in case anybody is interested. Um, that's, that's the model we're using. You can also use this idea for word completion. So anything that has above a certain prior probability, um, you could include on the screen. And that's what we do as well. So here, if I'm at the beginning of a word, I might be considering words that begin with W. And so then I'll put on the screen some words that are high probability that begin with W, uh, like what or we or why. Now, you don't have to do this. Um, you know, For instance, if you're looking at a drawing application or a gaming application or something like that, um, you might not have a sense that there are some clocks that are more likely than others. And then you could just default to something like putting equal probability on all the clocks. And that's fine too. Doing this just sort of helps everything go a little faster. Okay, so that's the prior. And we said that the other component of this is the likelihood. So what does the likelihood look like in this case? Well, the likelihood is the probability of clicking at a particular time, given that you know what clock you're clicking on. Um, and so we could actually look at what that might look like. So we might take a particular clock, like here's a particular clock, and we could have somebody click, try to click at noon, as we told them. Um, and see where their clicks fall. And so we have um, just a, a little purple dot for each time somebody clicked here. And you can see that this particular person clicks a little bit after noon. There's a little reaction time there. Um, and there's a little spread as well. And I think the right thing to take from this is not, this is something everybody does. 
but everybody's different. Um, you know, some people might click a little bit earlier in order to get exactly at noon, knowing that they have some reaction time. Some, for some people, the spread will be larger. For some people, the spread will be smaller. And so we really want to learn this distribution rather than just assuming it for any particular person. You know, sort of as we said in the beginning, we want to be adaptive. We want to, um, you know, be able to um, adapt to any new user and the way that they click. And so in order to think about then, how are we gonna estimate this likelihood? How are we gonna learn this likelihood for a new user? Let's take this clock and expand it on the real line. So all I've done here is sort of take the clock and then just moved it like this. So we have essentially sort of um, 6 a.m. to noon to 6 p.m. on the clock. And then the, the times that you see there basically depend on the rotation speed. So here, you know, we're, we're rotating through a couple of seconds. Now, one way we could estimate this is we could just have somebody click for us. You know, maybe there's a calibration phase and we just say, hey, click it, click it new. And they try to click their best. Um, and maybe, you know, they don't click perfectly, but they click sort of a, around noon. And so this is what we end up getting. We get a, you know, a histogram of their clicks around noon. And I just want to emphasize that we would not want to use this as our estimate of the likelihood because it's just zero in a lot of places. And we don't think that that's really meaningful that like, you know, they have this super high probability of clicking near noon and then it goes down to zero and then it goes up again. And what's more likely is, you know, we just got some sparse data from them and it's not perfect. And so there's this great idea in, again, statistics and machine learning called a kernel density estimator where you smooth this out. So instead of just putting down a point in your histogram, in fact, you'll put down a whole normal distribution or something like that. And if we do that, we get this nice smoothed out distribution that represents more what we think somebody actually clicks like. And again, their mode is a little bit later than noon, but that's fine um, because we're just gonna use you know, this as our model for how they click and so we'll adapt to that. Now in, um, in practice, what we actually do is we have an optional calibration phase at the beginning where somebody can click um, and Naman can just tell them like, look, here's the clock that you're clicking, just click you know, exactly on this clock at noon. And so we get a sense of how they click, but the reality is they're just gonna keep using this. And so we don't wanna spend all their time calibrating. And so a lot of the learning happens during the selection. So as soon as the selection is made, suppose that they select the letter A, then we can go back and we know for each of those times what they were aiming for. It was the letter A. And so we can say, well, where was that on the A clock? And so we can continue updating this kernel density estimator even as we get more data. And in fact, another thing that we do is we allow this to change over time. So if you think about a user, you know, you probably start off using this and it's new and it's different and you're not that great at it, just like with anything. Um, but as you get used to it, you're going to get better, you're going to get more precise, and you're going to get really good at it. And so you want this to be able to adapt to that. And that's exactly what we do. Essentially what we do is we have clicks that were more recent count for more in the kernel density estimator and clicks that were farther in the past count for less. So this is a form of discounting. So this is just adapting. Okay, so that's the idea. We've got our likelihood now, which is adaptive. We're learning it over time. We've got our prior, which tells us sort of, you know, what's more likely to begin with. Um, and that all gets combined in Bayesian inference to come up with, you know, what do we think that the person actually chose among the clocks? Um, and so let's go back and look at that um, demo that we have from before um, and just see now what this selection looks like when we're doing the whole thing. So I'm looking at the same um, demo from before. Now I'm gonna zoom so that we see the whole screen. So this is the screen that you'll see if you go to that website that I said from before, or it's also in the, the URL bar here. I already typed ZU, you saw that before. It's down here in the corner. And so now I can type any other letter as my next letter. So we have A, B, C, D, E, each in its own little box. What's also happening is it's giving me a variety of word completions. So I already typed ZU, I could type C, or I could type words that begin with ZUC. And we're seeing any word completion that has a sufficiently high prior probability. So zucchini is a pretty common word, um, it's a common vegetable, and so we're seeing that here. Um, there are some other options as well. We could have various um, you know, punctuation marks we could do backspace, we could do clear, we could undo the last thing that we just did. And this is telling us it was you, we could have a space. So let's try to go for zucchini. So here, what I'm gonna do is again, I'm gonna type, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit my space bar when that line um, is at noon. So I'll do that. 
And here I've chosen zucchini. And so now we have that whole word appears as well as a space after it. Now, a couple of other things to notice here is this is actually the estimate of the likelihood right now. So you can see that it's sort of around noon and you know it's relatively compact. And if I made a lot of mistakes, it would get fatter. If I got really accurate, it would get thinner. And we can see that. Um, a few other things. So this learn button controls if you get that big green flash whenever you've made a selection. Uh, this pause button, um, oh, sorry, this learn button controls learning the likelihood. The pause button controls the big green flash. Um, there's actually a sound that happens with each selection. Um, and so you can, you can toggle that as well. If you want to try out row column scanning um, and maybe come up with your own awesome ideas there, um, this row column scanning keyboard is here too. Um, there's also an emoji version of Namen. Um, so this is sort of interesting. If you want to choose emojis instead of just letters, and I think what's, what's, what's cool about this is there are a lot of things where you're choosing and there's no prior information. So if you're just choosing files in a file system or pictures that you want to put on Instagram or something like that, then that would be sort of analogous to choosing among emojis where there's no ordering. Um, and so this gives us just a sense of you know, how you can choose among a lot of different things. Uh, just a few other things here. You can change the clock rotation speed if you want it to be faster um, because you're getting really good at this. You can keep it slow. Um, you can calibrate in the beginning uh, the clock if you want to. Um, and also you can have just a little, this question mark will give you a little tutorial if you just want to like go through how it works and have a little information there. Um, okay, so let me try another one. Let's say that I'm going to try this word don't. I'm going to try selecting that. Um, so I'm going to hit that with a space bar. Now, something you'll notice when I hit that is that a lot of these clocks were blue and now they've become black. And so what that color represents is the probability of a clock. And so the high probability clocks are blue. And so we've, we've narrowed down which are likely clocks at this point um, and the lower probability ones are black. And something that's happening here too is that in order to get the most information from the clocks, the two highest probability clocks have their hands at exactly opposite times and the next highest probability clocks have their hands at the next time sort of to maximize the information that we're getting so we you know we're able to distinguish those really easily so i'm going to hit don't again um and then i've, I've selected uh zucchini and don't and i could just keep uh writing like this um so again maybe maybe i'll just take a, a really brief pause um to see if there are any questions at this point um also totally fine um if not um, but just in general about the operation or, or using this. Uh, there, is, there is a question. Uh, has advancements on artificial intelligence changed or improved Namon in any way? Perhaps improving the out suggestions? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think in general, there's a lot of really cool different areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and certainly, um, you know, being able to do uh, these kernel density estimates fast, being able to do Bayesian inference fast can be really helpful here. I think an interesting um, element of this, I mean, in some sense, like a lot of these are, are classical methods that are being repurposed in sort of this new way. But an interesting element here is, you know, you could also just think back to what I described earlier, this data analysis problem and approach it in a totally different way. So here I've, I happen to have chosen to approach it with Bayesian inference and kernel density estimators and with this combination. Um, but once you have this data analysis formulation, you can approach it with other tools. Um, and so it might be interesting to think, you know, are there other tools um, that you might be able to use for the same data analysis problem? Um, my guess is yes. Um, but then there's a question of, you know, is, is it more efficient? Um, is it going to work in a better way? Um, and I think these are interesting questions. So I guess, I guess, sort of my my end result is to say, you know, this this uses machine learning tools, but I it's not um, clear that this is necessarily the absolutely most efficient way that you could use machine learning tools. Um, and it would be interesting to explore. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So here we just have um, that likelihood we were describing before. Um, and so now let's just spend a little bit of time um, finishing up with some user studies. Um, 
and then just uh, concluding. So first of all, um, this first study involved just a single hour from each user. So it's sort of a preliminary type of study. We had 16 um, individuals who are new to both NAMIN and row column scanning. Um, and we wanted to compare them. There's also some information on an experienced user, but I think you should take that with a grain of salt because it's just one. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our longitudinal study going forward. Um, and I think that'll tell us a lot more about experienced users. But something you can see here is that um, we're looking at entry rate in terms of WPM or words per minute. So how quickly can somebody type? Um, and so we want this number to be higher, higher is better. We're looking at across block numbers. So here, the participants in the study had four different blocks of about 14 minutes each. So, you know, around a total hour of usage. And as expected, they get better at each method, both row column scanning and, um, and NAMIN, as they spend more time on the method. Um, and at least in this particular study, we see that NAMIN seems to be a, a faster way to enter um, text. And we can also look at other things, like you don't want to spend a lot of your time deleting text. Um, you'd like to spend as little as possible. In this particular case, um, there's some indication that NAMIN may involve less time deleting, although these error bars really overlap. And so again, I would take that with a grain of salt. But I think something that's really important here is just that you can get all of this extra flexibility without being worse in terms of these performance metrics. And in fact, possibly well being better. Um, we see a similar sort of thing in terms of um, click rate. Um, so the click rate there, again, there's some indication that it could be better with NAMIN, um, but certainly it's no worse than there within error bars between row column scanning and NAMIN. Um, we can also do user studies of, you know, how much are people enjoying this? Um, do they like writing using each of the methods? So here the grid two is uh, an awesome commercial version of row column scanning. It's, you know, sort of nicely um, supported and it's, it's really nice commercial um, software. Um, and at least here, it looks like people enjoyed using NAMIN. Um, it was easy for them to select word completions. Um, they're sort of, uh, this, these numbers are saying how much they agree with the statement. Um, they're saying it was easy to correct errors. Um, whether that's significantly different with the grid, again, that's within standard deviation. And same thing with, they don't have to look so intensively at the text area, that's good. Um, and it's sort of within standard deviation here. And so it just seems like what we really want to do here is a longitudinal study to follow up on this, a longer term study where we see sessions over multiple days with users that they really get more time. Um, and we can check all of these things with, with users that become experienced in the course of, of doing this. Um, and so I think that'll be um, really interesting to see. We actually, so we we're actually pretty far along in, the, in our longitudinal study um, that was in person when the pandemic happened. Um, and so now we've, we've totally restarted it virtually. Um, and so, so hopefully we'll have data on that um, afresh. Um, I think, you know, ultimately long term, what we're really interested in is a motor impaired user study. So both the, the results that I showed here as well as the longitudinal study are really going to be on um, able-bodied individuals because we want to check out absolutely everything with them and, and make sure there are no bugs and no issues before we get to motor impaired users whose time is very precious um, and valuable. Um, but something that we've been really grateful for already is the ability to um, get feedback from some motor impaired users as well as individuals who work with motor impaired users. Um, so for instance, um, we're extremely grateful to this awesome charity in the UK special effect um, that really does work directly with um, relevant populations here. Um, I'll also note that even with able-bodied individuals, we can do some work on emulating motor impaired users, or at least try to get a little bit closer to that experience. Um, so there's this great set of data um, that Dr. Heidi Coaster was um, kind enough to share with us and that she used in her um, papers, Coaster and Simpson in 2014 and 2017, that shows um, timings from both able-bodied AB here and motor impaired MI individuals. And you can just see that the simple reaction times, reaction times alone are very different between those two populations or they can be very different. Double press time is when sort of you need to react and then react again very quickly. So for instance, if you think of row column scanning when you had a row, but then suddenly you had to do something else, um, like you know collect the first thing in the column, um, that you also get this very um, you know, substantive difference in these populations. And so something that we found is that we can play with the switch to get um, more representative behavior from able-bodied individuals. So if we just give able-bodied individuals like a space bar or a button, they're super duper fast at it. They're, you know, they have really low as expected reaction times and double press times. But if we give them a more involved webcam switch that involves sort of moving around and, you know, extra work, um, we can actually get 
you know, reaction times that are more representative of something like we might expect from a motor impaired population. And so that's something that we're really investigating in this new longitudinal study. Okay, so with that, let me just um, make some concluding remarks. Um, so we're developing this Nauman software right now to facilitate single switch computer use. Um, I super encourage you to check it out at this first link um, and you know, let us know if you have any, um, any feedback. You know, if you find any bugs, we would love to hear that. Um, our code is available at the second link at GitHub. You know, actually, originally, this was our code for a Windows executable. Um, we've now transitioned everything online. There's a small difference in that, so hopefully we'll get that code up soon too, but like all of the underpinnings are, are there. Um, and we're working on, um, as I said, this longitudinal study right now. Um, if you're interested in the original paper um, and the longer tech report that describes a lot more detail um, than that paper, then I encourage you to check out uh, this linked PDF here. And then I'll just mention that I think there's just so much potential for great work here. Um, you know, we, I showed you, um, we have this particular version of um, Nauman that's on this website um, that I've, I've listed here. Um, you know, I have sort of a prototype from drawing from way back in the day, um, but developing better versions of this. I think this is a really awesome paper, not from our group, totally independent, on uh, taking these ideas in Nauman and making video games for children with severe motor disabilities. And I think that's wonderful that they've done that. And I just think there's probably so much more that could be done in those directions for gaming, for web browsing, for using an operating system or a desktop. Um, for drawing and honestly, even for um, writing, you know, we're doing some work in that direction, but I'm sure it's not the only work that could be done. So I just think there's a lot of opportunities here um, and, uh, and I hope you'll, you'll be able to check this out. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Tamara Broderick for the amazing talk about this important uh, question. We, have, we do have some questions if you'd like to answer. Uh, cool. First one, can someone use Nomon to select the, op the options in the Nomon website that you showed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so actually, um, so if you if you look at the drawing prototype, all of the options even are selected with Nomon, and you can do absolutely the same thing in the website that I showed. So, like the toggles could be Nomon switches. The the like. Um, the slider could be a nom and switch. Everything could be a nom and switch. It's an interesting trade-off. Um, you know, there's some sense in which if you do have a caretaker who's right there, they can adjust it, but obviously you want to probably be as independent as possible. This is the version that we're using in our longitudinal study right now. And so this is a little bit more convenient for us to be able to adjust for, um, for the participants. But yeah, I totally agree. I think the right way to go is to just really have everything um, be accessible with a single switch. And that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Uh, what does it learn when you undo a word? Yeah, great question. So, so one thing that I mentioned was that when you choose a selection, it updates your likelihood with this kernel density estimator. And so basically what you're saying when you've chosen that selection is, okay, you know, I meant to choose, let's say the letter A. Um, and so I'm going to add um, these little kernel density bumps of Gaussian mass at the times relative to A there. And so when I undo a word, I'm basically saying, oh, I shouldn't have learned from that. I had, didn't mean to choose A. And so what it'll do is it'll go back and take that out of the kernel density estimator and not include it. And so it'll basically update the kernel density estimator as though you had never chosen that particular letter. And it won't do anything based on the undo, it'll just do it based on you know, all of the letters you've chosen before. Okay. Uh, would the, just, okay. Would no more technique work if the user wished to multitask, like try to write a text and also surf the web to check for information while you're writing the text? Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that in theory it could. So you could imagine something where um, basically you always, I think the way that we all interact with computers is we're interacting with some kind of active screen at any particular point. And you can have sort of inactive screens like tabs on a browser that are you know, just somewhere else. And so you can imagine something where basically what you're doing is you're choosing um, which screen is active with Nomen, and then, you know, maybe you could enter some text on that screen, um, or you could, you know, choose some things on that screen. And then when you go back to another screen to be active, it's just wherever you left off last time. Um, and so at least it seems plausible to me that you could do this. I don't want to suggest that we already have done this, um, but it's, it seems uh, very plausible that it would work. Uh 
Professor Broderick mentioned that one of the aspects that were a problem when it comes to row column scanning was that it is impossible for the user to draw or gain. How does Nomon approach these particular issues? Great. So, um, so first of all, let me let me just add a tiny bit of nuance to that. I don't want to say it's impossible to draw a game, just that it's very difficult. Um, so, for instance, you could imagine that you could draw just in the same way that I showed for Nauman with row column scanning by filling like every pixel with something that you could scan, but then you have to scan through every pixel to get there, and that's just going to be a huge pain. And I think nobody would use it. So it's you know it's like it's difficult. Um, and then I think same thing with gaming, you know, if you could come up with a game that involves row column scanning, then like you could make a game with it. But I think there's a lot of games that we um, that we have that that don't have that mechanism. So my at least proposal for drawing, and again, I think that, you know, there's a lot of room for development here. So if you have a better idea, like go for it. Um, but my proposal for drawing um, and what we see in this, um, this particular uh, Python code that I have a mockup of is to just fill the screen with clocks. Um, and then what you can do is you can draw a line by choosing one endpoint of the clock and then choosing another endpoint of the clock and you draw the line between them. So you click this clock, you click this clock, and then you, that makes the line between them. Same thing with a rectangle. If you want to draw a rectangle like my student did with um, that MIT logo, you, take, you, you select the clock for one corner and then you select the clock for the other corner and then you've drawn the rectangle. And just to be clear, the idea is you, you with Naman, select, are you about to do a line? Are you about to do a rectangle? Are you about to do an oval or something else? Um, and so it's all self-contained. And then I think about, you know, if you think about the way that we, we um, game a lot of the times, I mean, there are a lot of different types and styles of games, um, but certainly many games have this, um, this feeling of, okay, you know, um, where do I choose something to happen? Um, maybe I want to, uh, you know, shoot in this direction, um, so I could choose a clock that's for that particular, you know, direction. Maybe I want to interact with this character that's on screen, I could choose a clock that corresponds to that character on screen. Um, and so, you know, um, I think one of the really interesting things about this uh, sort of um, paper that I, I cited at the bottom that had actually started pursuing um, uh, nomen for gaming for for children is that I think it's really interesting to think too. You know, are there are there better ways like types of games that this is better suited to? Um, are there ways that we can make games particularly fun with this mechanism? Um, but my hope would be that for a lot of things that if you just know where a user is sort of likely to click, like what are the the typical things that you would click? You could put a clock there. Okay, uh, I guess one last question. Uh, can the software adapt the options according to linguistic variation? According to what was the Li last part? Linguistic is variation. Um, I'm not. I'm not totally sure what that means. Um, uh, uh, if you can use another language on the software. Oh yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so what's what's actually really nice. So the way that um, something like uh, KenLM or these language models works is that you really just have to have a corpus of any language. And so if you have any language that's even like has any kind of text associated with it, you can just take a corpus of documents, just a bunch of documents from that language, and you can get basically the same language model out of it and then do everything that we did. If you had a different language where literally all you knew was the alphabet for that language and you didn't know anything else, like like you know what types of um, words were in that language or what was popular, you could still do the same thing. You just wouldn't have like the special efficiency that comes from having a prior um, and things like that. Now, I do think that there are going to be more difficulties with languages um, like uh, potentially Chinese, but given that people text successfully in Chinese, I suspect that a lot of that technology um, could go over into using this. Okay, there's just one more comment. Uh, it would also be interesting for motor impairment impaired people to use Namon for programming. Uh, a, a person would like to say that in the future. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I mean, I think that you could absolutely use this for programming. Um, uh, to be perfectly fair, I think that you could also use row column scanning for programming. I think the potential benefit of something like Namen would be that there are a lot of special characters that we use typically in programming, and it would be nice to have um, the ability to incorporate those without a lot of extra time. Um, and so I think this could be potentially beneficial in that direction. But yeah, absolutely. Okay, Professor, thank you very much for your talk and your time. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Okay,